getting started. Well, welcome everyone to Red Planet Live. I am your host, Ashton Zeth. I am thrilled to be hosting the Mars Societies podcast and leading the conversation about human exploration of the universe and the future settlement of Mars. As a longtime space enthusiast, I am passionate about STEM education and making humanity an interplanetary species. Thank you everybody for joining us today and supporting the, the Red Planet Live. Now today we have a very special guest, special woman, somebody that I look up to, and I have been so excited about this conversation, telling anybody and everybody that I know. Uh, with me today is Emily Calandrelli, a renowned science communicator, Emmy-nominated host, and advocate for STEM education. With a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT, she combines her academic background with her entertainment industry experience, scientific concepts, accessible to all. And as an advocate for diversity and inclusivity in STEM, Emily actively promotes equitable environments and encourages underrepresented groups to pursue careers in science. Her passion, expertise, and advocacy makes her a driving force in shaping the future of STEM education. Emily, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. So excited about this. And I, I just have to say, you know, quickly, I am rocking the Space Gal t shirts. Uh, you know, everybody, check it out. Go to Emily's website, thespacegal.com. Uh, Emily, I just I have to tell you a quick story before we dive in. Um, yeah. In April, I went on my bachelorette trip to Florida with my girlfriends, and me being me, wanted to go to the Kennedy Space Center. And so, of course, I had to wear my Space Gal shirt. Uh, yes. which I had ordered before I even knew we were going to be having uh, today's conversation. And so <laughs> it was so cool to be there um, at the Kennedy Space Center rocking my shirt. I was like, I hope people know, you know, if they get it, they know who, I, who I'm repping here. Um, oh, and I love it. I love that you go to um, one of the nerdy capitals of the world for your bachelorette party, like as one does on a bachelorette party. <laughs> right. Yeah. And all my friends knew like, you know, this is totally her jam. So they were they were good sports about it. Uh, but I, I got to show you my pictures here. So um, here I am uh, at the Kennedy Space oh Center, you know, trying, to, trying to highlight the, the rocket behind me. And I got my shirt on and it was so fun. I know with the sash. So great. That's so cute. And then um, I didn't know it at the time that you par par uh, partnered with NASA to do the narrating. So here I am on the tour bus. And I'm like, hey, look who it is. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah, that tour is like one of my favorite projects I've been able to do. Um, and I go back uh, every so often to do an update because, of course, like the yeah. – Base is changing. There are the launch pads are being updated to support Artemis and, and SpaceX and all of that. So I have to go back regularly and I have to keep that same shirt that I wore in the yeah. tour so they can just like splice new clips right. in. But yeah, Look, I love yeah, that. Time that. Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Like I said, this this really is a, a full circle moment for me. Um, just how everything is, works out. And, you know, I, I have this saying, and you'll hear me say it at the end, but the best is yet to come. I think I manifested this when I bought this shirt. I was like, that is so cool. I want to wear that. And, yeah, you know, yeah. before we are here today. So, again, thank you so much for being here. I'm just so excited to chat with you. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get into the nitty gritty, I just have a couple Mars Society announcements uh, that I, that I want to share. Uh, the first is our Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station crew number 15 has successfully reached Devon Island and is in the process of repairing and preparing for their two-week simulated science mission. The crew, led by Australian Andrew Wheeler, also includes UK scientist Olivia Dry Drayson and American PhD student Terry Trevino and Boeing engineers, Andy Greco and Caleb Poole. Now the crew of five uh, plan to stay at the station until early August. A full report of their activities will be, be provided at the Mars Society Convention this coming October 5th through 8th at Arizona State University. And there we go, we got a picture of the, the crew there uh, just landed and, and getting ready for their, their mission. Uh, the second announcement that I have is, uh, again, we talked about this before, but a reminder, the Mars Society is currently conducting our second annual International Mission to Mars Engineering Design Competition. The five-week program offers high school students from around the world the opportunity to work together to design a human mission to Mars, which they then must present and defend uh, their design in a debate round. 
The lectures provided to the students are publicly available on the Mars Society's YouTube channel. For more information, check out marssociety.org. Okay, so Emily, on the podcast, we do a segment uh, called Question of the Day. No right or wrong answer. It's always random. But as I was preparing for today's conversation and thinking about, um, you know, getting to Mars and what that means. And I was just thinking, wouldn't it be so nice if we could just get there so much faster? If it didn't take us, you know, at least six months and it wasn't a two year round trip, wouldn't it be so nice if we could just teleport there and, you know, use some sort of uh, technology to levitate and move everything around. So today's question is, is based on that thought. Would you rather have the ability to teleport yourself to any location or have telekinetic powers to move objects with your mind. Oh, definitely teleport. I feel like that would be way more useful. <laughs> Where's the first place you're going? That, oh my gosh, uh, Italy uh, every afternoon, probably. Yeah. Every morning for, um, uh, or maybe France. I would just like go to different places at uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner time. Just Thank a different country. Time. Feeling That's Italian for, for lunch, want some French, you know, cuisine for dinner, just, you know, yeah. go everywhere. I would agree. Yeah. I think about how much time you could save if you weren't, you know, commuting in traffic, you didn't have to fly somewhere. Every work event that you ever go to, if you could just, you know, snap your fingers and be instantly there, how much more convenient that would be. Oh, definitely. There's like not many instances where I'm like, oh, if only I could move that book faster to my hand. <laughs> Like, not really a problem I'm looking to solve, but like getting to places faster. Oh, that would be lovely. Yeah. And I saw, I think just recently you were flying and you might've had a flight delay and it was yes. a whole complicated process. We like waste so much of our life, uh, like in the inefficiencies of travel. And can you imagine how much time we would get back for like reading and with family and yeah. to eat food? <laughs> <laughs> right, spending time with your kids, you know, just yeah. more time enjoyment time. No, I'm I'm right there with you. Definitely teleport would be my answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I want to maximize as much of our time that we have and, and jump into the conversation. Uh, but I want to remind everybody uh, before uh, we get too far in, put your questions in the chat. If you have something that you're dying to ask Emily, please put it in the chat, and I'll be sure to to read some of those questions uh, throughout the conversation. But let's jump right in. Again, as I said, I've been doing my research, thinking about this conversation, and um, you know, I, I was thinking about your background and your career and your education um, and, and where you started and how you've gotten to this this point you're at right now. And I read an article in the MIT Technology Review that when you were starting to apply to colleges, you compiled a list of uh, typical salaries for every major, and you chose engineering because it paid the most. Oh yeah, <laughs> when you I, I think there are a lot of people who tend to have like especially in my field, a lot of my peers have these like beautiful, inspiring stories of their parents bringing them to a, a rocket launch or they went to space camp. Like I had none of that. I knew no scientists or engineers. Like uh, my dad grew up in poverty and he worked his way to bring my family where I grew up to middle class. And I had that like, like make yourself, uh, like bring yourself to a better position legacy in the back of my mind. And so my sights were only set on salary and I was just so practical. There was no inspiration behind it at first. And that's how I chose engineering. But then once I got in and I learned about, um, the vomit comet and I learned about NASA and I learned about like all of these research and discovery opportunities and internship opportunities, I was like, wait, I think I love this. And oh. it just became like a slow obsession that I started to push on like every other person I met. Like, did you know that this is really cool? Yeah. Um, and they pay you to do it. Like it's, it's a yes. And like, yes, you get a good paying job, which is what I cared about, but also like you can help make the world a better place. You can, uh, answer the unanswered mysteries of the universe, like all of this wonderful stuff. So, uh, ever since I discovered that I've been slowly pushing it, maybe not so slowly, pushing it on like every person I met. <laughs> oh, I, I'm I'm right there with you. Everybody at work, you know, everybody on my team always knows that like I have the space trivia, any space mm -hmm. topic, like come at me. That's that's my favorite thing to talk about. Um Love it. So trying to, you know, give the knowledge, make everybody else as excited as as I am about about space things. So yeah. would you say it's fair that 
you never had imagined you'd be hosting and producing your own show on Netflix. Was that ever in your wildest imagination? No, 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 no. I like my dreams when I was an undergrad, I wanted to uh, like start my own space tourism company. I had, uh, and my undergrad was gosh, like 15 plus years ago now. And so my dreams of commercial space started really early. Mm -hmm. um, I like was so excited about the tourism market. I was so excited about the, the privatization of space yeah. exploration and how NASA could partner with private companies. I actually when I was um, like a junior in college, I had to write a policy proposal on how to improve NASA. And my policy proposal was that NASA work with private companies to bring um, non-professional NASA astronauts to the yeah. International Space Station, people who would be willing to pay to go to the International Space Station. I was like, yeah. this solves a few problems. It helps uh, like give NASA more budget or allow them to free up budget for other things. And two, it can help garner public support because we can see these people that we feel a connection to, whether it be in art or uh, music or uh, politics or whatever it be, um, go to the space station and report back to us. And yeah. I thought it was such a fun idea. And then fast forward 15 years from now, we see that happening now. Yeah, you, you nailed it. That was something I absolutely wanted to ask you. Uh, but before we get specifically to the commercialization of space, um, you know, you had a, you you mentioned about artists and and various people that are not the traditional type of astronaut. Uh, somebody like myself, um, you know, I love space, I love science, but I didn't graduate with a STEM degree, so I feel like my education um, is a little bit lacking. But I'm eager to learn, expand my under uh, my understanding of engineering, aeronautics, chemistry, mm -hmm. etc. As a science communicator, do you have any recommendations for like courses, programs, or specific websites that somebody like myself could further my education? Right. Yeah. And I wouldn't say your education is lacking. I would say you're just focused on perhaps a different aspect of the world that could bring unique perspectives to the space industry. Because I love it when people have a passion for science, but they also have um other interests and capabilities and creative um, talents. Because when you combine those two things together, you can create something really unique, like this webcast, for example, that a traditional um, scientist or engineer like wouldn't think to create. And by doing so, you create something that welcomes more people, like you cast a wider net of um, uh, making it more welcoming to more people and attracting a different type of audience to space exploration that wouldn't traditionally see themselves in it. Um, but if you're looking specifically to be an astronaut, NASA is absolutely, you know, they're looking for the hardcore STEM degrees. They're looking for people with um, uh, like flight experience, people in the military, people with test pilot experience. We're getting back to the age of Apollo where um, test pilots can be incredibly useful because we have these new spacecraft on the horizon from uh, the things that the uh, SpaceX and, and Blue or, or uh, well, Blue Origin, yes, but SpaceX okay. and Boeing are creating to get to the station, but also the new lunar lander vehicles. And so anyways, the, the traditional um, backgrounds that they looked for in the Apollo era, I suspect they're going to, we're going to see them a lot now. And especially, um, I would say geology is going to be a yeah. really big one. I just listened to, um, Pam Melroy give a talk a couple days ago. She's the, um, deputy administrator of NASA. So the second in command at NASA and mm -hmm. she was her backgrounds in geology. So perhaps this is why she leaned into it, but she was saying how, um, ge oh wait, no, maybe it's not. I, I'm, I'm mixing her and Lori Lesh and I, we had a big summit where we heard from a bunch of really cool people and I'm mixing their talks. But anyways, she was discussing how um, geology ma majors are going to be important when we go back to the moon, because that science is one of the primary reasons we're excited to go back to the moon and have a sustainable presence there. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, and admittedly geology, you know, that, that course in college was always so much fun and you know, like I said, not feeling like I have that technical degree that gives me that prerequisite to to know what I'm talking about in, when it, in terms of, of science. Um, mm -hmm. But just the other day, I was trying to remember, okay, we got igneous, sedimentary, like I, metamorphic, I re need to remember the various types of rocks. So always trying to, yeah. you know, stay on top of this, um, 
you know, it's been so long since I was in school, but, you know, trying to stay fresh and, and that it's, it's relevant. And I actually, like I said, know what I'm talking about, but you hit on something about the, the traditional, you know, test pilot uh, point that I had, had a question on. So right now we're seeing the, the expansion of the commercial space industry. That traditional profile of an astronaut has sh somewhat shifted from the military test pilot to include, you know, experts in various fields, citizen scientists, and even individuals who are able to buy tickets uh, aboard, you know, flights such as New Shepard, uh, Virgin Galactic. You kind of already answered it and you touched on it, but do you see that as a benefit to the industry and mm -hmm. will we see you aboard a rocket anytime soon? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been like trying to get on a flight with Blue Origin since they announced it. Um, I just need to have a few more years of saving some money perhaps. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a very exciting thing to see this. Uh, there are are analogies that people often use in this scenario, the most popular one being how computers, when they were first introduced, they were as big as a room and they were so incredibly expensive that only the wealthy could afford them, like government agencies and the wealthy. But you needed that early adopter of the really rich person to be able to um, be able to sustain the market long enough so that they could innovate further and bring down the costs so that other people would be able to afford a personal laptop. Um, and so some say that is what we are seeing in the aerospace industry. I'm, I, I'm a little skeptical to know, to, uh, to think that perhaps the rocket launch will ever get cheap enough that the everyday person who can afford um, a laptop would also be able to afford a flight. But I am hopeful that it comes down from the whatever, you know, like 500K to $2 million that it is today, um, down to a little bit less. So instead of like purchasing a house, maybe it's like purchasing a car or a used car, or something like that, that somebody um, it maybe in like their retirement years would be able to like splurge on. So I am hopeful that the price comes down. And I do think right now it's a good thing that uh, what we're seeing, because it means that there is hopefully a market that can sustain it long enough so that we can see that innovation. And hopefully people, um, more people and I, myself included, will be able to benefit from that innovation later on in life. So yes, um, I do hope to take a ride to space one day. Oh, that would be so cool. Well, I'm, I'm going to be the first one that's on that live stream watching as you go up. I'll be rocking my shirt just like I am now. <laughs> Um, but something you, you mentioned, uh, you were at a summit this week and you were hearing some uh, people speak. Uh, yes. I saw that you shared on, on social media, you were at the Brooke Owens Fellowship Conference. Yes. Can you tell us about Brooke Owens Fellowship and, and what's your involvement? Yeah, the Brooke Owens Fellowship was this um, fellowship, internship fellowship that was started about eight years ago now um, by these just powerhouses in the aerospace industry. You have Lori Garver, who's a former deputy administrator of NASA, Will Pomerantz, he was employee number one at Virgin Orbit. He's worked at XPRIZE. He's done, he's been on the forefront of a lot of really innovative companies in this industry. Um, and Cassie Lee, who is uh, lesser public facing, but also just has a huge influence on the aerospace industry and beyond. But they created this fellowship in honor of their friend, Don Brooke Owens, who had passed away from cancer. And she was someone who had a huge mark on the aerospace industry herself. And so what it involves is it's for women and gender minorities and undergrad who want to work in the aerospace industry. And we get like a thousand applications worldwide a year, and we can only select 40 to 50 students. And we match them with interviews from the top um, aerospace companies. And so they have the opportunity to have a paid internship. They get executive mentorship and they do the summer summit, which we just came back from, which oh, is God. like no other conference that you will ever go to. Oh, um, we refer to it as like a professional conference with heart. It's a professional organization with heart. And so there's a lot of uh, dancing, there's slam poetry. Like it's just absolutely lovely. We were painting a lot. Like it is super fun. And so anyways, it's a, a fellowship I feel really passionate about. I've been volunteering with it from its get go. And my, three years ago now, I believe maybe a little uh, under that, um, they asked me to be part of the five member executive team. So I've been helping run it for the last three years. And it's just been, it's a 
wonderful thing in this industry to help provide um, women and gender minorities a network and a friendship and a community in this predominantly male dominated field. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's really great. Yeah, it looked like so much fun. I, I was, you know, as I was watching those videos and you're doing like the arm tunnel, it kind of reminded me of summer camp, like oh, 100%. So I want to be there. And yeah, it looks like you guys yeah. were having so much fun and and how awesome for for those women to get you a, as a mentor, um, you know, somebody that's that's so well known and has, has made such a name for yourself in the industry. So uh, I'm sure that they're so excited about that opportunity. Um, really cool. And that you give back your time uh, like that to, to help others that want to get involved um, in the industry. So yeah, that's really cool. Thank so speaking you. of of giving back and getting uh, young people interested, uh, specifically wanted to touch on Emily's Wonder Lab, uh, obviously a children's program on Netflix uh, featuring fun science experience and STEM focused education. Uh, how do you hope to ignite curiosity uh, in future gener generations and can you share anything about future programming? Oh, yeah. So Emily's Wonder Lab was a passion project of mine. So I fully wholeheartedly believe in the power of media um, and its and its ability to shape culture, but also tweak stereotypes that we have in our minds. And when I started my first TV show, Exploration Outer Space, um, I'm told I was the first woman to host a nationwide science show in the United States. Um, and that was 10 years ago now. And that is a, to me, that was so surprising. Like how, how is it possible that I am the first, I'm certainly not the first person to be qualified to do this. I'm not certainly not the first person to be interested in doing this, but um, for the longest time, the only people who got those jobs were people who looked like Bill Nye. And mm -hmm. so being able to see someone who was a female doing science on television um, was weirdly groundbreaking. And then when I did Emily's Wonder Lab, I also just coincidentally happened to be nine months pregnant when I filmed it. And so the response from that show was just absolutely wild because Netflix has the reach of, I mean, they're in 198 countries and 38 different languages, and they are the largest streaming platform in the world. And I got responses from people all over the world talking about how this is changing in real time their children and what they want to be when they grow up. Their little girls are now talking about how they want to become a scientist because being a scientist feels fun and can be girly. And there were um, uh, homework assignments called uh, the draw scientist. It's called the draw scientist test. This is a very famous test that's been around since the 80s. It's a test that simply asks young students to draw a scientist, like draw what you think a scientist looks like. And um, for the longest time, 90%, more than 90% of the drawings were men. You, the girls and the boys would draw white men with like crazy Einstein looking hair and a white lab coat. And those numbers have gotten slightly better over the years, but a few people sent me their draw scientist tests. And one that stood out in my mind was from uh, a family with a son named Gavin. And the picture that he drew when he was asked to draw a scientist was me from Emily's Wonder Lab. And not just me, but pregnant me. He drew like a big old belly yeah. <laughs> in the what a scientist looks like. And it's like, that's what he thinks a scientist looks like. And how monumental is that? Because it's important for little girls to see women in science roles when they grow up, but it's just as important that little boys see that too, because that changes the way that they see their peers and the women throughout their life. And that project to me so far has been one of the most influential things I feel like I've done. And I'm trying to continue to pull on that thread. So mm -hmm. in the background of all the work that I do, I have a running list of pitches and TV shows that I'm constantly meeting with producers about um, and pitching to networks and platforms. And it's like such a grind because for gosh, like 50 pitches, one might land. And so oh you just have to like be in the game because most of these networks, they're so used to still even today hiring um, men to host the science shows. Uh, they just, it feels so unnatural for them to see a woman and have them be placed in an analytical scientific 
scientific, critically thinking role. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these things that I audition for, for other shows, it's always the guy that gets the, the critical thinker scientist role. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're still, we're fighting against that uh, stereotype that even Hollywood still has today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I have to say, um, my my own boss, uh, like I said before, I work for, for a tech company, and um, her daughter watches your show. And so a year ago, when I came uh, onto the, the team that I'm on now, uh, talking about science and, and all the things and the space, uh, you know, enthusiast stuff that I'm interested in, and she mentioned you specifically. Uh, so again, just full circle moment that, that we're here today having this conversation. Um, it, it, was, it was meant to be for us to land here. But yeah, it even at, um, you know, such a, a local level, people that I know, students, young kids, young girls uh, are watching your show and it's making an impact. And, uh, you know, Genevieve, she, she likes doing science experiments and uh, specifically, you know, things with geology. So, yeah, it is really cool to see that, uh, so fun. At, at, you know, so close to home. Um well, I wonder, it's just recent, but the new uh, actor and writer strike, have you felt the impact of that yet? I mean, I know it just happened, but you're in the process of putting these ideas and shows. Have you felt it yet? Uh, I wish that I uh, could feel the impact of that because I'm not currently on any SAG shows. And so Emily's Wonder Lab was a SAG show. I'm in SAG myself. And so if that were still running, then I would feel the effects of that. Um, and so like, obviously support everybody on strike. And I'm like being, I'm like watching the rules to make sure that I don't, um, go against anything that they, uh, are telling people not to do to, to be in support of them. Uh -huh. And so I huge supporter of it. And I think the, the one thing that it's going to impact is that, um, networks right now just don't want to hear any pitches because they don't know how this is going to land. They don't know what their budgets are going to look like later. And this is kind of the double-edged sword of things is that they have a library of contents that they can just rehash and reuse mm -hmm. and they can sort of wait us out, uh, yeah. which is really unfortunate because they don't necessarily need to make a lot of new stuff right now exactly. because they have this huge backup library that they can continue to use, including Emily's Wonder Lab, which is still performing well on the Netflix platform. People are still finding it every day. Um, so I think if anything, it's just going to like stall any progress that could mm -hmm. be made. And so hopefully the studios will um, listen to the actors and writers so that the people who are actors and writers can make a living wage. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's good to hear your perspective on that. I was yeah, curious. Um, but mm -hmm. like you said, I mean, they have so much content that's already there, this library that they can lean on. You know, streaming services is, is not going to come to a halt, uh, you know, next week and right. can't continue. Um, so like you said, they, they might be holding out for a while. Um, but, you know, as a, a prominent advocate for women in, in STEM, what advice do you give to young girls who aspire to pursue careers in traditionally male dominated fields? How can we continue to dismantle that gender barrier and foster a more supportive environment for women in STEM other than, you know, shows like Emily One and Emily's Wonder Lab? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, there's a, a number of things that people who like it, it's hard because the burden really is on the people who aren't the girls and the women in STEM. It's like the, the, the people in power who are making those barriers still exist today. And the mm -hmm. men in the industry who are not super kind to um, women in the industry as well. But for girls growing up, I would say the most important and beneficial thing that you can do to sort of fight against um, the challenges that you will see along the way is building your network with other mm -hmm women and gender minorities in the industry because in a male any male dominated industry especially aerospace that is uh how do they say it say it um uh, pale male and stale um that is an old boys network from which like opportunities and advice and promotions and friendship flow through and a lot of times it's not nefarious nobody is doing it to intentionally be mean it's just that like when you have a job opening, you're like, oh, I have a buddy from my frat who I loved working with. Like, mm -hmm. I'll tell him to apply to the job. Yeah. And that just happens over and over and over and over and over again so that it's this like cyclical problem. And so what you can do to sort of combat that 
is to have your own network where you can share ideas and advice and jobs and just have a friendship so that you can have somebody to talk to who understands what you're going through in the industry. Mm-hmm. And that network can start as early as K through 12 with Girl Scouts or with Girls Who Code or Black Girls Code or robotics teams or whatever these organizations that you have at your disposal, um, they can be really helpful in building that network early on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know exactly what you mean uh, with that. You know, you're thinking of an open position. Oh, I'm going to refer my my frat bro. Um, it's that unconscious bias. Maybe you don't yeah. even. Think about it. You're not intentionally. Oh, I'm going to exclude the women, and I'm only going to nominate men. Uh, right. but, yeah, you you picture that's the right type of person uh, to, to fill that role. Um, in those male-dominated roles, uh, I'm curious, do you ever feel imposter syndrome? How do you tackle that feeling if you do experience it? Yeah, I certainly did when I was younger in my career. I think that um, there were times where I just was less sure of myself. I thought that being different was somehow a weakness um, in that arena. But Now that I've gotten older, and and I'm sure I still experience it from time to time, but I have learned to view my differences as my strengths, as Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I should be speaking up in the room, because I perhaps see the problem a little bit differently than people who haven't had the same challenges and experiences and background as myself. And Uh, Whether that be like my difference being I'm the youngest person in the room or the difference being I'm the only one from rural America or the difference being I'm the only woman in the room, whatever it could be like that uniqueness, that difference in perspective is your superpower because innovation, whether it be in like storytelling and creativity or science and technology, that difference of ideas and opinions and approaches to a solution, that is what affects innovation. Um, Time and time again, we've seen when you have diversity of thought and opinion, it improves innovation and the bottom line. And so when you are uniquely different in any way, that is your value. That is your superpower um, among all the other things that you can, you can bring to the table. Yeah. Man, you got me fired up. I'm ready to walk into some room and like, I got ideas. Listen to ideas. (laughs) Exactly. Well, I, I see we have a ton of questions uh, from audience, but I want to try to get through some of those. I see a question from David. It says, what's the age that produces, oh, sorry, let me scroll real quick. Um, what is the age that produces the most influence on girls to go into STEM subjects? And what was the most inspiring memory or movie that you can recall? Yeah, I, I have to look at the study again. There's a few studies that talk about how, um, there's a there's a drop off of all kids of people interested in and in science and space. I, I want to say around like middle school, but there's a larger drop off with girls, um, like a significantly larger drop off with girls. And that is about the time when people suspect we get these stereotypes in our mind about who science is really for, Mm because all kids love space when they're little, like they love space and they love dinosaurs. That is like a universal interest. Mm -hmm. But at some point along the way, we infuse this idea that space is really, really for guys. It's really for boys. and so I would say one of the most influential ages is the age that I had like a range of ages that I really like to focus on, which is ages six to 10. And so all of my books and Emily's Wonder Lab, those are for kids ages six to 10. And that's really focusing on that, like we call it bridge demographic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, so that's a, that's an age that I think we can really impose uh, like role models in STEM for these kids. Um, And then what is, let me read this question. What is the most science inspiring memory or movie that you can recall? Um, Oh my goodness. Um, I, let's see, movie. I loved Contact. Contact is great. That's a classic. Oh yeah, love it. That's a classic. But to be honest, like I don't spend a lot of my free time watching space movies. I like I will. But like I like bad space movies like I love Armageddon. Like Armageddon is one of my favorite space movies. Uh Um, So I'm not someone who is like, well, technically in Interstellar, the blah, blah, blah. Like I'm never going to be one to criticize a space movie. Like I just I enjoy them. I think they're fun. So, yeah, for me, um, I am just a general lover of all like science and space movies. 
Yeah. Want to be, just want to enjoy the moment, enjoy the yeah. movie and not look for all the plot holes. And that's not right. correct. That would never happen. Kind of takes away from the enjoyment. Yeah. Like if you want to press a button to remove gravity, go for it. Go for it. Who's to say that in the future there won't be a button where we can remove gravity? Like, I don't know. I'm certainly not going to make a video about how uh, much of a scientific flaw that is because I certainly don't care that much. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I hear you there. Uh, I see we've got another question. Uh, it says, what type of activities, events, movies, or public figures, celebrities do you think can inspire or motivate women to get into the STEM field? Oh, gosh. I mean, I, it's a it's a whole thing. Like you can do so many different things. Everybody's going to respond to something different. But I think whether it be a book or a movie or a YouTube channel, whatever it is, I think if you can find a way to put somebody who looks like them or has something in common with them in front of them in like a character in a book or a character in a movie or the person doing the YouTube channel or Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is. Um, that's the key is to try to make it look like, Oh, that she kind of acts like me. She's, she's yeah. girly like me, or like she's from West Virginia, like me or whatever it is that that connection that you have with them mm -hmm. um, gives them a pathway to seeing themselves in the future. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You, you kind of hit a, a struck a chord there with me. I wish that, you know, when I was a kid, I had had more influence or I had gotten an opportunity to to meet with the astronaut or go to space camp as a kid, because maybe that would have put me on a, a different tra trajectory. Um, I loved science. I had, you know, my, my room had moons and stars on it and I loved contact and I had a glow in the dark, you know, Orion constellation poster. Uh, but I didn't really see that, like you said, as, is that's where I fit. I belong. I'm the yeah. type of person that could be in that role. And maybe if I had had that influence at a younger age, I, I would have, you know, been on my way to, to being an astronaut. So yeah, I, I commend the work that, that you do and trying to inspire that next generation. Um, cause it really does make an impact. So yeah. Appreciate that. I see another question here from Hendrick. Uh, it says, I assume you would like to go to space at some point. So would you rather do it on a quick trip up and down Bezos trip or a week long SpaceX Dragon mission? Oh, that's kind of a funny question because it's at, like asking, would you rather have one million dollars or 50 million dollars? Like the 50 million dollar one. I want to do the 50 million dollar one. Um, so both ideally. Um, but it's, it's a hard comparison. Maybe if the question was like, if we, would you rather do 50 suborbital flights or one orbital flight? And I would probably rather do one orbital flight. Um, I applied for that inspiration for mission that mm -hmm. was done, um, funded by Jared Isaacman yep. and followed that mission closely. And that looked incredible like the, the the crew and the mission and like every thing that they did for raising money for saint jude like that is the perfect space mission yeah. in my eyes and so doing something like that uh would be my preference 100 percent, absolutely agree i mean that netflix documentary one is amazing but to have that type of situation where you can donate and in sort of this Willy Wonka type of situation yes. or are thrust into this position where you get to participate. And crazy that Chris happened to be, you know, working for an aerospace company and he just fit into that role so, so neatly. And, you know, Dr. Science Proctor, her relationship with her dad and him working on Apollo, I mean, it just that that crew was was meant to be. It just oh my gosh. Incredible yeah. story. Uh, like listening to Haley and Cyan talk about these things, it's like, it, it just sounds like a dream. And they're, I don't know if you've ever watched their interactions together, but they're the most adorable best friends. Yeah. And it's like, they're such a powerhouse and so different in so many ways and speak to different audiences and they come together and they're even more so of one. And so they picked like the perfect crew for that mission. And I am obsessed with all of them. <laughs> okay. Well, if, if you get a chance, you know, to talk to any of them, Dr. Sam Proctor, uh, mm -hmm. let her know. We're, we'd love to see her on the podcast. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. That would be, that'd be incredible. Yeah. Uh, I see we have another question here. Let's see from Marash. Why go to Mars and how could you answer this question to the public and governments? Yeah. Why go to Mars? Um, 
I mean, it, it's certainly a valid question of like, is it worthwhile for our taxpayer investment to go to Mars? Um, and there's a few different ways to look at it. I think one of the primary reasons that really resonates with me is that um, we don't want to make the same mistake the dinosaurs did and have all of our eggs in one basket in case anything were to ever happen to Earth. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if we want to become an interstellar species, we will need a stepping stone to be able to extend our footprint into the solar system and then later to other solar systems. Um, and so I think Mars is just the next best thing to go to um, to start that journey. Um, and I think the the taxpayer investment aspect of it, like, is it worthwhile? Um, I, I Maybe Musk has said this in the past, but my favorite way to describe this is like, um, should we be spending 99% of our budget expanding the human race into the solar system? No, no. Should we be spending 50%? No, 25%? No, we have so many problems here on earth. We shouldn't be spending anywhere near 25 or 50%. But should we pre be spending like, 0.02% of our budget expanding the human race into the solar system. Mm -hmm. Like maybe may, that kind of sounds more right. And it's probably even less than that because so much of NASA's budget is earth observation, managing satellites that study our planet, um, uh, improving aviation to make it quieter and cleaner, doing science here on earth and doing robotic exploration of other planets that the human aspect of it is a, is a good portion of their budget, but it's not 90% of their budget. I don't even think it's like quite half of the budget. So anyways, um, I think that the amount of budget we are spending to expand the human race and to prevent uh, us from ending up like the dinosaurs is currently appropriate. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you mentioned, uh, you know, Mars being that next stepping stone to prevent, you know, something catastrophic that may happen like the dinosaurs. What about Mars, its atmosphere, its chemical makeup? What about Mars makes that the right place to go? Yeah. I mean, I think Mars is a crappy planet. I <laughs> would not personally want to go there. I think it is an awful planet to start a civilization on. Um, but we don't have anything better. Like we, that is the only option. And that is what makes it a good option is because like we could go to the moon, but the moon doesn't have any atmosphere to speak of. And at least on Mars, we can pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and make um, like water and oxygen to breathe and all of these things. And so um, Mars is a crappy planet that I would never want to live on, but it's the best we've got, which uh -huh. is why um, it is the place that we choose to go. Right. That's that's the best option. I was just watching um, Exploration Outer Space and uh, I, I was binging. I think I'm on season four and I, and I saw our own Dr. Zubrin on there. Uh, so it's really cool to, to see, you know, you get to interview, um, you know, Dr. Zubrin and, and various experts as well. Um, but I wanted to know uh, what emerging technologies or scientific advancements do you find the most promising? And how do you think these developments are going to help enable humanity to reach Mars? Oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, NC2 resource utilization is always going to be a really important one because that's the number one thing that we need to get right if we want to be able to sustain life on another planet. Um, and that one is already in the works with robots on Mars. Um, but I am excited to see that be tested out at scale because that's going to be something that is going to be critical for to uh, sustain life on Mars. Um I think, yeah, that one, primarily, that's the number one thing in my mind. I, I think the radiation challenge uh, is obviously another huge one to make sure that once humans get to Mars, we don't have to have them stay there because they died from radiation. Um, so protecting them from the radiation on the trip there is mm -hmm. something that I'm very interested to see how we deal with that challenge. Um, but yeah, I think those two things in general, and also maybe the mental health aspect, because as we said, Mars sucks. Can I say that <laughs> on this podcast? Like Mars is not a fun, I like, I, and unless you are going to live in places like Antarctica uh, or like in the depths of the ocean, 
Um, you're probably not going to enjoy Mars. Mars is a very extreme environment. I'm not even someone who likes camping. So I am not the right person to send to Mars. There are people who would love to go to Mars. I am just not one of them. And so I think the mental health aspect of like not being able to experience the breeze on your face and going out and experience mm-hmm. sunshine on your body, like yeah. all of these things are going to be factors for how to actually sustain like happy, healthy life, life mm-hmm. on the red planet. Yeah, absolutely. And those experiences that are so innately human, like you said, having wind and sunshine, I mean, those those are experiences that you have your, your entire life. So to be stripped of those uh, would definitely have an impact on your mental health. I was really intrigued by, uh, there's a particular episode uh, where they're talking about 3D printing, specifically in the medical field. I thought that was such an incredible idea, how that could potentially be used, as well as uh, re- there was... Um, the medical uh, conversation about reducing your body temperature so that you go in some sort of like hyper oh, yeah. hibernation kind of yeah. uh, to help with the, the journey there. Yeah. Uh, what, what is the future of that? Is, is that something that could Gosh. actually happen? I have no idea. I have not checked in on that technology since we filmed it like seven years ago. <laughs> so I generally, like I genuinely have no idea. Um, it, it sounds like that, technology would be really useful on further trips. Because I think on a six month trip, like, I guess maybe if you're really concerned with um, like food and water and waste, but you would still have to provide some sort of food and water, even Mm -hmm. if you're in a hibernated state, just less of it. So I, I don't see that being critically necessary for a trip to Mars. Um, But maybe for like future interstellar trips, that's going to be when that technology comes into play. Yeah. For, for those deep space trips, uh, yeah. we're going to do that. uh, speaking of, of long duration trips, um, I specifically, you would cross my mind. Uh, I was watching, um, the, uh, good night Oppie documentary and it was so sweet that people were so touched by the story of opportunity, uh, which was obviously sent to Mars on its 90 day mission, but ended up surviving 15 years. Uh, And when Opportunity had tweeted, you know, my battery is getting low, it's getting dark, it struck a chord with the general public that began to mourn its life, even individuals that didn't have anything and weren't involved with the building or or keeping it alive. Why do you think people felt such an emotional connection to Opportunity? Man, humans are so weird. I also felt that too. And I'm like, I want to know who wrote that because that is the most clever way to like connect people to a robot without like a soul mm-hmm. <laughs> like yeah. how how are we collectively crying about this robot we have no connection to it works. Um, got me yeah i got me too and i think it's just it's so clever because humans relate to human emotion and this is one of the reasons why when I make TikToks about science, like I do not hide my excitement and I don't like uh, uh, hide my like my body movements and I, I don't act like a, a news reporter just like reporting, lecturing the news because that human connection when we're mad or excited or tearful or whatever it is, or happy, like we find it funny or whatever, mm-hmm. that gives us this Phys- like it feels like it's a physical connection to something else and it makes us care. Mm-hmm. And that like getting people to care is the hardest part of science, the hardest part, because it just feels so um, like sterile sometimes. Yeah. And getting a human story behind it is the key to getting people excited and to listen to it. And so um, humanizing the robot in that way was like, Chef Kiss genius. <laughs> genius. Yeah, marketing genius there. I mean, yeah, to see people tweeting and you know they're they're cr- upset and they're crying and they're they're mourning the loss of this rover. Um, yeah. but I think that's so incredible and it's gonna be important uh, for a lot of reasons, but obviously getting the general public to support the funding of these programs if they yes. make that connection with with a rover, um, you know, we can see those missions continue. So yeah, really very, very much important. And um, that documentary is so good as well. So true. Give it a watch. I know it's on Prime. Same with Exploration Outer Space, also on Prime. (laughs) Uh, You know, last month I I saw you had posted images of you being on a submarine. Oh, yeah. What was that experience? What were you researching? How long you were there? 
Oh yeah, it was just a media trip. So every um, so often, um, the different organizations like the Navy and the um, the Air Force will invite media to go on um, like a VIP trip to be able to like show them the technology behind the work that they do and the technology that they use um, to share with either the news or with their followers. And so I've done similar things in the past where I've worked with the U.S. Air Force to fly in an F-16 fighter jet and like share that experience. And then this one was the Navy showing off what it looks like to live on a submarine. And the subtext behind all of this is that they are trying to recruit people to be submariners. And one of the hardest people that they have a hard time recruiting is women. Um, women for a long time were not allowed to work on submarines. Um, and so they have a lot of time to make up to try to make them feel excited and comfortable and safe on a submarine. And so they invited me along and I went on a 30-hour trip and we spent the night on a submarine and we uh, they showed me probably about 50 or 60 percent of the ship. There were some parts of the ship that were just classified that I wasn't mm -hmm. able to see. Um, uh, like the nuclear engine, so or the nuclear reactor. So it's a nuclear powered submarine, um, or it's called a nuclear submarine. And what I wasn't sure of, is I was like, does this mean that it has nuclear weapons on board? No, it does not mean that. In fact, there's actually a policy that they're debating right now to see whether or not they're, they could allow nuclear weapons on these submarines, because right now they're not allowed. Um, but uh, it's nuclear powered. So they have a nuclear reactor on board that powers the ship. Um, and that's important because it allows the submarine to stay submerged for longer periods of time, months at a time, without having to reemerge for oxygen, for air, for like a diesel generator. Um, and so it was just, it was a wild, wild trip. And it was also um, a few weeks before the submersible news came out, um, which put the whole trip in a different context. I mean, it wasn't even close to being a similar submarine or a submersible. Um, but I think I probably would have gone in with a different mindset if yeah. I had seen the submersible news first, because mm -hmm. uh, that was quite scary. But my, my trip was wonderful. We got to do a lot of different things in the submarine. Um, I got to, I'm, I'm going to be sharing a video of it soon uh, in the next hopefully month. But yeah, it was pretty crazy. Okay. Well, I'm going to look forward to that video. Will that be posted on your new YouTube channel? Yes. On YouTube. Okay. Excellent. Well, trying to get that YouTube channel. Yeah. I, I think, did you just pass, was it 20,000? Something. Yes, you have done so much research. You were so good at being a host. Well, um, yes. you. and all your stories. I'm always watching. You'll, <laughs> you'll see my likes on there now. Um, yeah. All, all oh, tabs. Um, well, you know, obviously we've talked about your various programs. Um, you're an author of multiple books. You're an engineer, a mom and a wife. What's next for you? What else is on your want to accomplish list? Yeah, um, I am pitching a lot of shows, but um, there are less, few, there are fewer ears to hear them at the moment because of the strikes. So um, I'll, I'm putting a pause on that for now. But to be honest, my time is completely in this YouTube thing um, because God, this is a full time job um, making. I promised my followers one video a week, and I was like, why did I do that? <laughs> There's so much work with just me filming and editing and sound mixing and um, animations and like everything. Uh, so it is quite time consuming, but um, I'm excited to build it up because that's for me been the last social media frontier that I've been holding off on because I've been just so scared mm -hmm. to embark on it. And I'm just, I'm finally focusing on it. And right now I have like my head down, just grinding away at making these videos. Yeah. What about the the YouTube frontier has been uh, daunting that you didn't want to tackle it until now? Well, I, my specialty has been um, short form video and I just use, I, I use my phone and I never use a microphone and that like lower quality um, video is totally fine for, it's totally fine for Instagram. Like you, it doesn't need to be professional. In fact, mm -hmm. it feels more, more authentic if it's not, but yeah. YouTube, the expectation of quality is a little bit higher. And so I was like, I need to hire someone who knows something about lighting to get my lighting uh, set up. I need to learn more about audio mixing and editing and animations and all of these things. So I can tell the stories that I want to tell in the right way and show them off 
with a higher level of production. And so I just had to do a lot of learning before I felt comfortable putting myself out there on that platform. Yeah. Yeah. That absolutely makes sense. And yeah, I do love the very genuine, authentic feel that, that comes across in the, the Instagram and uh, TikTok videos and uh, always giving updates, um, you know, about things that you're, you're going through, like I mentioned earlier with the, the flight delays um, going on the submarine. So uh, it definitely feels like we're having a, a conversation versus like the YouTube is just kind of out into the void and anybody and everybody can, can tune in. Um, so I, I totally yeah. see you in there. Uh, but yeah, excited and, and wishing you all the best on the, the YouTube channel. Thank uh, you. Besides YouTube, do you have any other projects, any upcoming releases? Yeah. So I have um, a new book in my, let's see if I have it here. No, my um, Ada Lace book. I have my a sixth book in the series. It was so funny. I had five books in my Ada Lace series that we wrote back in like 2017 and they did well, but we didn't get um, an offer for any new books and until Emily's Wonder Lab came out and all of those books shot up in popularity because of course they're about, it's the Ada Lace Adventures. They're about a young girl in STEM. Wow, you guys are so on top of it. Yes, so the orange book right there is the new, the new one that's coming out in October. Um, so three months from now, my goodness, that's so soon. And then my Stay Curious and Keep Exploring book came out this year, maybe, maybe last year, I forget, but it did really, really well. And so they asked me to write a second book um, within like three months of it coming out. And so I wrote a second book that has 50 more science experiments that will come out next spring. It's called Stay Curious and Keep Exploring Next Level. And I'm really excited about th these guys because I, I spent a lot of time um, thinking through what stories I wanted to tell and what new experiments I wanted to show off. And um, yeah, so those will come out October and then next spring. Okay. It's going in my Amazon cards. I was wondering, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Mark Rober again, another, you know, NASA engineer designer at Apple with his job to do YouTube and his videos are amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, but he has now released, uh, he's got the crunch labs and he's got the subscription box for kids that yeah. they can build and think like an engineer. Would you ever do something like that? And something for adults, because I will sign up. Ooh, I love that idea. Yes, I think um, I have been working on um, ideas on that front. The challenge is to be able to get the price point so that it's affordable. You have to really have a following at the level of Mark Rober to be able to just get it to an affordable price point. You have to make a ton of them to be able to get the price down. And like, if anything, if I do anything, I want to try to make it as affordable as possible so that the most like highest number of people can participate in it. And so creating an affordable box is something that's a priority for me. And I want to wait until I get to the point where I can actually accomplish that. Um, and so, yeah, stay tuned. It's always something that I have my eye on. It's always something that I find like really useful and important. And so um, someday soon, perhaps, because I love I love what Mark is doing um, with those. The Crunch Labs looks so fun, like a Willy mm -hmm. Wonka for science, yeah. like genius. Love that idea. So great. Yeah, I hope there's no limitations on like uh, the age qualification yeah. for the person yeah. that Willy Wonka to go because I will buy the subscription just so that I can get that that chance. Um, yeah. And like I said earlier, you know, for myself in particular, wanting to expand my my knowledge and my understanding. So if there was something, you know, for adults that could get mm -hmm. hands on, they could learn at the same time. That is totally something that I would participate in. And you've, you've got a market right there. Yeah, I love it. That sounds great. Okay, well, keep that in mind because yeah. I'm gonna be looking for it. Okay. Uh, we're, we're right at time. Uh, Emily, thank you so much for, for coming on today. This was such a fun conversation and there's so many other questions I have for you, but I'm, I'm glad we got to the heart of everything that I was really wanting to ask and uh, such, such a great participant. So thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. I uh, want to give a special thanks to uh, our executive director, James Burke, uh, Michael Stoltz, our friends at Liftport, Michael and Leah. Uh, and of course, again, Emily, so, so wonderful to speak to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. 
It was so great to chat with you. And thank you for doing so much research. Like you were so well prepared, Ashton. This was like a very, very fun interview. Thank you. You know what? I have to admit. Um, so I'm I'm on Western Washington right now for, uh, like I said, a, a business event. Um, but I live in Eastern Washington. I mm -hmm. have had exploration outer space uh, playing in my car the whole five hour drive. I was like, oh, that's a great point. I have to ask this question. Oh, I love that we talked about this. Um, so that's I went so full funny. inch mode, uh, but I had so much fun doing it. I mean, that's the type of stuff that I want to, uh, consume on my everyday anyways, even if I wasn't, you know, preparing for this conversation. So I appreciate that you make that content because I am the type of person that, that wants to consume it as much as I can all the uh, time. So yeah, love to hear it. That's the best. Well, thank you again. I appreciate everybody's participation today. Uh, such a great conversation. Um, and as I always say, the best is yet to come. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day, and we will see you next month. Bye, Bye. everybody.